So let's kick off this inaugural episode with me currently being game-ended by ragweed pollen in the good old state of Georgia, and start something a little new as I try to explain scientific endeavors in the community. This channel will not be too unlike my other channel, except it will be only science, and I imagine videos will be shorter for the time being until I kind of find a footing with it. I put up on Twitter the other day asking people what they wanted me to cover, and CRISPR won out. Oh, what's CRISPR, you ask? Well, CRISPR is nothing more than a clustered regularly interspace short palindromic repeats. It is a family of DNA sequences found within genomes of prokaryotic organisms such as bacteria and archaea, but not in eukaryotic organisms such as ourselves or other animals, or really anything multicellular like trees, grass, cats, whatever. To understand where CRISPR comes from, we need to go way back to the oldest war on Earth. Back in the day, and actually still currently, a war between bacteria and viruses were and still are fought. Now we all know viruses are pretty detrimental to the human body, and it's no different when it comes to prokaryotes. The virus will latch onto the bacteria looking for cellular markers, injecting its RNA, and the bacteria will begin replicating this coding, creating viruses, and eventually burst forth from the cellular membrane. Every day, a vast majority of the bacteria living in the ocean are actually game-ended by viruses. Upon their injection, this would spell out the end for that prokaryotic organism. Over time, the bacteria essentially got tired of the complete onslaught and developed something that can be likened to a cellular immune system. In humans, the cellular immune system is our cells attacking foreign objects entering our bodies and breaking them down. Usually this occurs with cells, but our bodies will attack dirt, pollen, transplanted tissue, you. If your body thinks it's a threat and it's not supposed to be there, it will try to do away with it. The same can be said for the Cas9 protein complex working in conjunction with a template known as CRISPR. Somewhere along the line, the prokaryotics developed this resistance and survived an attack from a virus. With access to the RNA coding the virus injected, this was sort of a gotcha moment for the bacteria. It now had the ability to recognize a threat of a similar virus later on. By using this RNA strand to compare and contrast all other free-floating RNA inside the cell, this would give it a huge advantage in identifying any attackers. Cas9 is a DNA and RNA cutter. Usually it's an RNA cutter in its normal form, but we will get to the DNA portion momentarily. So setting this up, a virus comes and injects its RNA into the prokaryotic organism. Inside of this prokaryotic organism are defenders known as a Cas9 protein complex, equipped with the memory of the previous attack from a virus. But also I should point out, it's not just a prokaryotic being attacked by a virus. What can actually happen is should a prokaryotic cell undergo apoptosis, the remnants of that prokaryotic prokaryotic organism will actually be left behind and the bacteria will be able to pick up this information from the non-living cell and use it for its own gain. But also in a process known as conjugation, two bacteria cells will go up next to each other and they will exchange genetic information. When this happens, the resistance to a virus can be passed along to the other bacteria and now they're both resistant to the virus. Anyhow, so with that kind of how do they get that, the CRISPR element fits directly inside of the Cas9. Cas9 will hold onto this RNA component and read any RNA that it comes across. When it finds a part that links up correctly, it will then cut the RNA, rendering the viral coding useless and non-infective. This was a great boon for the bacteria and presumably the only reason prokaryotes haven't been completely stomped out by the sheer amount of viruses located on Earth. Like an extra bit of Earth lore for you, if you took all the viruses and laid them end to end, you would have a line roughly 100 million light years long. That's how many are floating around you on a constant and daily basis. So how does this work for humans? Well, RNA isn't so dissimilar from DNA, really. Granted, in DNA, it's adenine, guanine, cytosine, and thymine that holds the coding together, and in RNA, it's adenine, guanine, cytosine, and uracil. But apart from that, their basic components are quite similar. So similar, in fact, that thymine binds to adenine, and so does uracil. This is the basis of how CRISPR works. So there you are. You damage your genes by putting your head in a microwave or eating a spent uranium rod. You think to yourself, man, it'd be really cool if I became the Hulk, but instead, you just end up with melanoma. What do you do? Well, enter CRISPR and the Cas9 protein complex. You have one of two things available at your disposal. Attack the cancer outright, or use a beefed up version of your normal immune system cells and attack the cancer. So let's start with option A, attack the cancer outright. CRISPR and Cas9 can be delivered via a virus to specifically seek out markers on your cancer cells and inject their coding. Here the template along with Cas9 can enter the nucleus of the cell and that begins to change the genetic coding found there. It can use the template to cut out certain genes or damage them to turn them off. So deletion is essentially getting rid of the entire gene, turning off would be sort of just damaging the gene. In the event that you go with something crucial and cut that gene, this could lead to the cell's eventual degradation. So say if you were to turn off the gene to increase mitosis, this would also bring the cell back down to its normal status with the rest of your cells and give them the ability maybe to reintegrate back into the body with not too many issues. So with the DNA altered, that's one way to attack cancer. Another way is to beef up your own immune system. You are going for complete decimation on this one. The cells had it too good for too long and they decide to work against you and now must pay. You can use CRISPR and Cas9 in a very 
similar matter to change the makeup of your white blood cells, neutrophils, but most importantly, the killer T cell. The killer T cell's main purpose is to find cancer wherever it may be in your body and destroy it. Sometimes, however, it cannot recognize a cancer cell effectively as the cellular markers on the surface may not be correct. When this happens, cancer is allowed to flourish, and there's also another host of just crazy things that happen, but we'll kind of go with that for right now. With CRISPR and Cas9, you can effectively enter certain coding into the genes of a killer T cell, which ultimately can help it recognize cancer cells more effectively. It can seek out these cells with great ease and destroy them. Liken it to two people, one person is in a dark room and is told to find another. In a second room, another is given a flashlight and told to find another person. The first room is just your natural killer T cells. They may find them, but it may take a while. The second room is your natural killer T cell with the aid of the flashlight or CRISPR and Cas9. Much easier to find them and get the job done. CRISPR and Cas9 have given us the opportunity to gene edit like never before, going down to the building blocks of a person and correcting rampant protein production like in prion disease or helping the body release the right amount of chemicals at a certain time, which would help with mental disorders. Because after all, it all comes down to our genetic coding, and I know it's nature versus nurture. I know it is. I'm more partial to nature. But anyways, it's how we operate and what's operating within us that gives us deviations to how we conduct ourselves. Now, like I said, there is a psychological aspect, and I can hear my fiance yelling as I say this, but it can be likened to fixing the foundation of a house. If the base is good and sturdy, then the rest of the house works better as a house. Something to note about CRISPR, though, is there's still a few, let's call it moral issues that could arise. Everyone is well aware of it, but when you alter the genes of a person, you can also alter the genes of an unborn child. With this being the case, it raises the question, should we do it? Personally, I believe CRISPR should be used in a capacity to aid an unborn child that may suffer from a genetic disease. Considering you can quite literally fix everything, inherited genetic disorders could be, in theory, a thing of the past. But what about more vain attributes? Height, muscle build, body proportions, hair? These things should actually be avoided, as it could quickly devolve into a situation of natural human versus designed human. Another issue that has arisen with CRISPR, and this one is more anecdotal as I was discussing with a colleague one Saturday night at the pub, it is that in their effort to use CRISPR, they have found that sometimes the gene will remove the gene they inserted and actually repair it with the original. They aren't necessarily sure how it's happening, but as of last we spoke, they could have fully realized the problem by now. But the moral of the story is that the genes are self-repairing the old gene in favor of the new gene. This means a steady dose of medicine would have to be administered over a long run or until the body stops inserting this faulty gene. So, uh, go a little easy on me. This was my first step into a more scientific side of YouTube. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, hit the like and subscribe. And if you didn't, well, just, you know, give me some time. All right, so that does it for me. I hope you enjoyed, and I will see y'all in the next one.